We will now address some key issues in actually applying the five forces framework for industry analysis and practice. So how do you do it? You should begin by clearly identifying the boundaries of the industry. One approach that I find particularly useful is to be very clear about the who for each of the five forces. So, for example, you should be really clear about which sets of firms are competitors and which ones make substitutes. Similarly, think about who you would consider as potential entrants and about all the entities to include in buyers, for example, intermediaries like wholesalers and retailers as well as the end consumers. Then you should examine the structural attributes of each force with the goal, of course, of developing an assessment of the strength of that force. You can then rate each force according to whether it's favorable for industry profitability or not say along a scale of strong to moderate to weak. Having completed these three steps, which we have already covered earlier in the module, you would now turn to how the five forces are combined to assess the industry's profitability. Finally, you might explore some dynamics. How might your industry analysis change as the industry itself and its structural attributes change over time? So once we have evaluated each of the individual forces, how should we combine them? Should we simply average out the degree of competition from each of the forces and get an overall rating for the industry? Or do it some other way? Let me make this a bit more concrete with an example. Imagine we have two industries with the same average rating over all five forces. But one industry, let's call it industry one, has a moderate level of competition in all five forces. So the level of competition in all the forces are essentially equal. And the other industry, industry two, has only one but very competitive force. Let's say it has very low entry barriers. But all the other forces in industry two are less competitive, that is that they're better for profits than industry one. So then overall, which industry would be the more profitable of the two? Industry one or industry two? Would they be the same in profitability? Keep in mind that these are two industries that have the same average favorability across the five forces. So what would your answer be? And what is the logic for that answer? I like to use a metaphor to answer this question of how one evaluates industry profitability by combining the five forces. Imagine I'm hiking high up on a mountain and come across a lake. The water in this lake is being held in place by five dams. So what determines the amount of water being held in this lake? In this example, I want you to think of these five dams as the five forces and of the water in the lake as industry profits. Just as gravity is acting on the water to try and make it go downhill, the forces of competition are constantly acting on industries to drain away their profits. What is keeping the water and profits in place are the barriers to these forces. So if any one of the dams was weak and broke down, of course all the water from the lake would drain away through that breach. And it wouldn't matter that the remaining four dams are strong and still standing tall. In the same way, profits in an industry are susceptible to the weakest of the five forces. An industry with five moderately strong forces will be more profitable than one with four very strong ones and one very weak force. We can also take these ideas a step further. Because it drives ultimate industry profitability, the weakest of the five forces can be thought of as the pivotal force for industry profitability. Just as building up the weakest dam can help increase the water level of the lake, strengthening the weakest force can improve profitability of the industry. Therefore, as a manager, you should generally prioritize doing something about, or at the very least, closely monitoring the weakest of the five forces. Let's take this idea of a pivotal force a bit further and motivate it with an example. As we have just noted, a pivotal force represents the greatest threat to industry profitability from competition or bargaining by either entrants, rivals, substitutes, or suppliers. You've also seen from the analogy of the dams why mitigating an industry's pivotal force can directly improve industry profitability. A nice example of this can be seen in the US airline industry. As discussed earlier, rivalry is perhaps the most important force in the airline industry, its pivotal force. But in recent years, the airline industry has gone through a few major mergers, which has increased industry concentration. And airline companies have also gotten better at airline seat utilization so-called yield management, reducing the need to slash prices to fill all those empty seats at the last moment. As a result, airline price rivalry has not been nearly as bad as in previous time periods, 
and the industry is even making a little bit of money. Once you identify the pivotal force in an industry, it pays to keep an eye on it, and especially on the structural attributes of the force that make it so competitive. After all, changes in this force are most likely to directly impact the industry's profitability. Managers might also strategically intervene to reshape the pivotal force and thus improve industry profitability, as we've seen in the case of airlines. I will now make a brief segue into a topic that often comes up with five forces analysis. One of the major criticisms of the original five forces model is that it ignores complements, which can be important for the success of many products and services. For example, the success of many electronic hardware products depends on the available software and vice versa. When complements are important for an industry, it can be included as a sixth force. However, the effect of complements can actually be seen as the conceptual opposite of substitutes. Rather than decreasing industry profits, value-adding complements can actually increase them. But an industry's overall relationship with its complements is a bit more tenuous than that. While there are benefits from cooperation with complement producers, there is also the potential for competition over the joint value created by the two complementary industries. In this respect, complement producers are also akin to suppliers. Ultimately, industry players must learn how to operate in so-called coopetition, that is to simultaneously cooperate and compete with complement producers. We now turn our attention to understanding how to analyze industries as they evolve and change. Industry evolution and change can take many forms, and I highlight here two ways, but not necessarily the only ways, to make sense of them. One approach draws on an understanding of changes in the macro environment, say from utilizing the PESTLE framework. In pharmaceuticals, for example, an important legal and technological trend is that many important drugs are coming off patent and not being replaced by equivalently valuable new drugs. Another approach is to rely on known patterns of industry evolution over time, such as the industry life cycle depicted here. We know, for example, that structural attributes like demand growth, scale economies, product innovation, and differentiation are likely to vary over the industry life cycle in systematic ways. Once we know the anticipated pattern of change, we can work out what it means for the industry by applying five forces analysis under the anticipated new structure. Thus, for example, we can work out that generic substitutes might become an important factor in the pharmaceutical industry because of patent expiration. And because threat from substitutes is probably the pivotal force in this industry today, it might actually be valuable to focus on changes of this force going forward as they are likely to have a direct impact on profitability. Over the years, I have seen many students make the same errors in applying industry analysis. I think it would be valuable for you to know what these errors are so that you can avoid them. One common error is not being really clear about the industry you're analyzing. As I noted earlier, identifying which actors fall into each of the five forces is a good way to overcome this potential error. Another error is being either too broad or too narrow in defining the industry, which is something you can overcome over time by developing better judgment. The third one, which goes hand in hand with good industry definition, is keeping track of the various actors in each of the five forces. So we might recognize at the outset that generics should be considered as a substitute for the pharmaceutical industry, but did we actually include generics when we analyzed the threat from substitutes? A fourth important error is that many people think of the five forces model as simply an opportunity to describe the different actors in each of the five forces and just stop there. What you have then is a nice description of the industry, but no analysis. Another error is to focus too much on hard structural attributes, like scale economies or industry concentration, and not enough on softer behavioral attributes, like risk perception or brand loyalty, which can often be much more important. An important conceptual mistake is to use one force in the five forces model to explain another. For example, the threat of substitutes in this industry is low because rivalry is low. This is just wrong-headed analysis. Now, it is possible for some structural attribute to affect more than one force. So differentiation can affect both entry barriers and rivalry. But industry entry barriers are conceptually distinct from rivalry among existing firms in the industry, and they should be treated as such. Another error is to stop after evaluating each of the five forces and not evaluate overall industry profitability. 
In fact, that is the ultimate purpose of industry analysis, to evaluate how profitable or attractive an industry is, and you should get there. You may recall from earlier in this lesson that you should not simply average across the five forces to evaluate profitability. Focus on the pivotal force instead, the one that is most competitive. Some students, particularly those who peak at industry financials, will draw conclusions based on some short-term indicators of industry profits. Even notoriously unprofitable industries like airlines can have short-term spikes in profitability and vice versa. Do not be misled by them. Last but not least, and this one is more of a recommendation, you should look at the dynamics of how industry structure is changing and also ask yourself what managers should do based on your industry analysis. If you manage to avoid most of these errors, I think you're well on your way to becoming an expert in the Five Forces Framework. Despite the enduring appeal of the Five Forces Framework, it does have a few limitations. It is mostly a static framework, even though we have learned how to extend it to dynamic situations. It is also a framework that is based on the idea of competition over some surplus or value. All of the implications are drawn from the extent of this competition, but very little attention is paid to actually how the value is created or to innovation. Also, because there are many details about different structural attributes and how they might affect behavior and then in turn performance, the Five Forces framework requires some learning and sophistication. But once you master it, it provides very deep insights that go well beyond loose frameworks like SWOT or even Pestel. So in conclusion, I would like to highlight the following things you learned in this module. First, I hope you now recognize that firms are embedded in their environment, which can consist of many nested layers. The outermost layer is its macro environment, and the Pestel framework provides a good checklist for analyzing the macro environment. You were also introduced to industry analysis using the Five Forces framework to understand how attractive or profitable an industry is. Industry analysis is based on the structure conduct performance paradigm which says that structure drives the conduct of industry players, which then drives profit performance. You also learned how to combine the five forces to predict industry performance and how to extend the five forces model to industry dynamics and change. Finally, you were introduced to some common errors and limitations when applying five forces analysis.